as soon as you say you need to get a vaccine because that's going to give you better resistance, they'll say, no, 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 I've seen these studies. Yeah, but you don't know who's not going to be well protected from getting it. So that's the reason to get a vaccine. Welcome to the Rain Insights on COVID-19 podcast. I'm Emily Donahue. Let's listen as Rain founder David Lawrence speaks with doctors Fred Southwick and Bill Lang for our weekly coronavirus update. Fred and Bill, as always, uh, thank you for taking some time with us. Uh, it's been an interesting week. Hopefully you can bring us up to date. And maybe we'll start with what the data says. Uh, there's been a fair amount of commentary and chatter that possibly we are reaching a peak in terms of the virus and uh, things will get better. But um, tell us what you're seeing and what people should, in fact, expect. David, what we're seeing in the data is a great example of what we've said throughout this uh, pandemic is that you cannot look at it as a single pandemic. It is a series of linked regional epidemics. And the way the data is is playing out is indicative of that. If we look at New York City, the first major area in the United States that was hit hard with Omicron uh, early last month, the we are now starting to see, we, we have peaked. Over the past 10 days, the rate has come down by about 30%. Um, and there's no sign of that letting up. So that's very positive. A couple of other major cities, Chicago has just turned the corner and is starting to come down. The Northeast in general has started to turn the corner and come down, although you can't generalize it completely, um, especially in major cities, the places that were hit harder earlier. Looking internationally, no sign of, of resurgence in South Africa. Um, Israel, which has been very concerning because Israel was hit hard fairly early on, had shown no signs of the the increases letting off just over the past couple of days, has started to possibly turn the corner and come down in case counts. And finally, the UK has definitely turned the corner. Now, all of these things, these are limited locations, um, typically big cities, and it's only been, with the exception of, of uh, New York, it's only been a several days of, a, of changes. So I don't know that I'm really comfortable calling that a trend yet. This time next week, I think we'll have have a really good idea of the direction we're going. But importantly, this is what a lot of the models said was going to happen, that Omicron is going to hit everybody hard, fast, and then it starts to come down. And I think it's looking in some ways like Omicron is um, acting almost like a, a vaccine in, in giving people protection. How long that's going to last, that's going to be a very, very important thing to determine. And there's no way to know except to wait and see. Yeah, I agree with Bill uh, as assessment. And I should point out in Florida, we're still in the peak. And uh, Miami-Dade County had 581 per 100,000 uh, daily cases, which is just incredibly high, the highest in the nation and probably one of the highest ever reported. So uh, we're still in the throes. The other concern is, um, and Bill, I know, knows this as well, uh, that a lot of people are using home tests and they do not report those positive results. So it's highly likely that the number of infections is far higher than is being reported. Uh, but then the question, and, and they, all the models uh, for Florida as the rest of the nation does show a sharp peak and a sharp drop off. And so the hope is in the next three or four days, Florida is going to start to see that drop off. Uh, but we don't know that yet. And the question comes up, how much immunity, uh, herd immunity will be achieved by the Omicron? And I am fearful that a significant percentage of these patients, individuals have very mild symptoms and are likely to have very short-lived immunity. And it will not take the place of the vaccine. So uh, I think we should continue to push hard for uh, the three shots, the two, uh, if you haven't had any, and if you've already been vaccinated, uh, getting that third shot to really achieve uh, reliable, persistent immunity. Fred, one of the common questions that I get is, so if you have had the two shots and you have a breakthrough case, do we think that's as good as a booster? 
uh, with the uh, Delta and, and the Alpha, that probably was the case. I am not sure about uh, this variant, and I have not seen any data. There was a significant amount of data showing that if you get an infection after the vaccine, that you do get a jump, and it's like another shot. So I, I think for certainly that was true of Delta and Alpha, but I do not know about the Omicron. Well, it's what, what I've been telling people is that if you get a breakthrough, you might consider that a booster, but for only 90 days, because that's that's what CDC is telling us, that if you get infected, you can consider yourself relatively immune for 90 days. And it may be longer than that, but don't assume it's good forever. We'll need to reassess what we know as we get to the end of March, early April, about all these people that have gotten uh, infections and breakthrough infections over the past month. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable assumption. I think that's relatively conservative uh, and and would be a, a good course of action at this point. Fred, let me, let me insert a, a, a question to that. Why are people trying to parse through, you know, is that as good as, and, and why would you not just take the third vaccine. I, I'm, I'm always curious why people are trying to become, you know, sort of self-trained physicians or, um, you know, in some respects, you know, data experts around this. And that I the, agree so, with you, David. Uh, why, why, you know, why even ask that question? I, I, I think we all fall into that because there's so many people that are anti-vaccination that we actually are are uh, trying to address that repeatedly. And again, uh, I think the overall principle is a active infection versus vaccine. As far as the reliability of immunity, vaccine is far better than getting infected for a long lasting and reliable immunity. And look, the uh, yardstick, if I can use that term, should be you wanna keep yourself safe, your family safe, your friends, your loved ones, etc., your co-workers, your fellow students. Okay, it just seems like a uh, uh, an academic debate at this point that we shouldn't be having. All right, I just well, David. What, yeah, one other ahead, point on it though is yeah. there there is some good data out there that getting infected gives very gives in many cases very robust immunity, perhaps even better immunity than you get from vaccination. But the problem is. You can't predict who is going to have it. And so that's the big thing that CDC is saying, is that the immunity that you get from vaccination is relatively robust, predictable, and we, we know the dur we have a good idea on the dur durability of it. With a, if you don't get a vaccine and you rely on natural immunity from being infected, you don't know how intense that uh, resistance is going to be. You don't know how durable it's going to be. So it's, that's, the, that's the issue. Because if, if, as soon as you say, you tell somebody, no, you need to get a vaccine because that's going to give you better uh, resistance, they'll say, no, 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 I've seen these studies. Yeah, that's right. But you don't know who's not going to be well protected from getting it. So that's the reason to get a vaccine. It's a bit of a dice throw. Um, just moving along, uh, a lot of conflicting information. And again, um, we talk about the different legs of this um, pandemic. It is, there's a biological, there's a psychological, and there's clearly the political. Um, questions that businesses are asking is for very straightforward guidance. If somebody does test positive, what should be the period of quarantine? And you know, we've 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 seen the number go from ten to five, and I know you both of you have been looking at not just the data, but you know, you've had conversations with a number of your clients. What can you share with us in terms of best judgment around quarantine periods, and how, how do you kind of square the circle with what the CDC is saying, and um, and potentially, uh, you know, other reliable medical sources. Well, you've got to remember where the five days came from. It was not based on the science of the infectivity. It was based on a recognition that in many parts of the country, uh, the healthcare system, and to some extent other uh, critical infrastructure sectors, were going to 
be critically short of staff. So they needed to get people back. So CDC started looking at where's the inflection point on the curve where there is going to be where the number of people who are still infectious is going to be small enough as to be tolerable. Um, and hopefully that their degree of infectivity is low enough that it can be uh, mitigated through the use of wearing a high quality mask. That's where they came up with the with the five days. It was it was never originally looked at as being the the general guidance to the whole population, many of whom are not going to follow the the second part of the guidance which is but then for the next five days you must wear a a high quality mask in all settings most people aren't doing that they hear the five days and they're done um, so i've been telling all the the organizations that i work with that look i'm not comfortable going below seven days for keeping people out of circulation out of the the, the organizational environment because i'm just i'm too afraid that at five days there are too many people who are still uh, carrying adequate amounts of virus as to be infectious i i agree with bill on this and and i've experienced uh, where uh, individuals at work were tested at five days who had tested positive originally, waited five days, their symptoms were somewhat improved, and the, the antigen test was positive in virtually every single case. And therefore, I think five days, based on uh, brief experience, is too short. And I, I think a seven day is a reasonable compromise. Uh, and you know, it's all a matter of risk benefit. Uh, the CDC thought the risk benefit fell at five days. Uh, in whatever environment you're in uh, and the environment I'm in, I think seven days makes more sense. Now, now the, having said that, I work with, and I've talked about in the past, a, um, a sports league, and we are allowing people out before 10 days if we're demonstrating that they have um, uh, decreasing or increasing CT counts on PCR. Um, and we have not, doing that, we have not had any uh, secondary infections that, that we know of. And this is with pretty good monitoring. So, I, but I still, I, I think five days is just too short. And, and interestingly, on the PCR uh, CTs that we're doing, we're not finding too many people who have CTs that are adequately high counts um, before five days, or at before seven days. Great insights, and uh, that actually, I think, will provide some clearer guidance than what is out there in the uh, uh, the official marketplace. Uh, let me ask both of you, um, as various companies have announced uh, breakthrough drugs for the treatment of COVID, where do we stand with um, the available protocols and uh, drugs to treat patients who do come down with COVID? So at this point, we have, um, we have the drugs that we've had for a long time, steroids, remdesivir. Um, there are still some concerns about the tex toxicity of remdesivir, which is only being used in um, inpatient setting with people who are generally not doing real well. Um, the steroids clearly work very well, but these are kind of old drugs. But as we know, over the past month, we've had uh, now three, uh, two antivirals and a long-term monoclonal antibody product that have been approved. The two antivirals, uh, Molnupiravir and uh, Paxlovid, and those are, those are antivirals similar, different types of different mechanism of action, but similar to Tamiflu for the flu. And the data on Paxlovid especially is pretty compelling. Um, you know, greater than 90% efficacy, very, very a, a side effect profile that was almost identical to that of the, of the placebo that was administered as part of the, the, the test. And molnupiravir is not as efficacious, only down in the 30s. Um, and there are concerns about potential side effects, not a whole lot of demonstrated potential side effects, but there's some current concerns about the mechanisms, mechanism of action. Uh, and then the third is, uh, I will not get the name of it right, um, E... I'll, I'll, I'll come up with the name of it, but it is a long-term antibody product. But the 
problem is that's not actually used for anybody other than people who have uh, significant uh, uh, immunocompromise. The product is EvuShield, E-V-U Shield. Uh, but this is only for people who cannot, who will never be able to make their own antibodies. And it's not any use for the general population because if you once get it, then you pretty much are, you, that's the only way you're ever going to have any immunity is to keep getting it periodically. So as long as the virus is around, you'd have to keep getting it. But the Paxlovid and the Molnupiravir can, especially the Paxlovid, it will be a huge change. Problem is, it's not available. Um, it's there's numbers of of courses of the drug that are being distributed are in the you know, tens to hundreds per state. Um, that's nowhere near enough to meet the demand. So we probably will not see it in adequate levels until at least next month, if not into March. Um, and by then, with as we were talking earlier, there we may be through the. Um, the, the worst of this. Yeah, I, Bill, excellent summary of, of, the, of the different drugs. And the Pfizer drug, uh, uh, I can never pronounce the name, the, starting with a P, it's just Paxlovid, is a protease inhibitor, and protease inhibitors have proved to be very good in HIV and is very effective uh, at reducing hospitalizations. Uh, really, you couldn't ask for better than 90%. Uh, one a little caveat about them, they, in order to boost the protease inhibitor, they use it, uh, it's a combination drug with ritonavir. Ritonavir um, actually inhibits a cytochrome P450 system, and the, by inhibiting that metabolism, raises the levels of the protease inhibitor. The only trouble is that also impacts a number of medications. So you have to be very careful with drug-drug interactions uh, when that does come on the market. Right now, our hospital, we have, have not gotten any of, of any of these drugs. So the problem is they're in such short supply, it's unlikely that we'll get sufficient supplies before this surge is over. So I think it's too little too late, but in the future, this, these will be of great benefit. Fred, I'm not gonna drag you into politics, but we had, uh two significant decisions uh, by the Supreme Court. Uh, the one decision of 6-3, uh, basically upholding the right of uh, hospitals to enforce a vaccine mandate on their workers. Um, maybe without, again, getting into the politics of this or, or the legality of it, practical effect, um, since you're on top of a major hospital, um, one of the things that's been a little bit um, curious, if I'll use that term, is that uh, while doctors have a high, high percentage of uh, compliance with vaccinations, uh, healthcare workers were not. Uh, this, in part, at least fed into, I think, concerns of other people in the population wondering why, what did healthcare workers know that we don't know? They work in the hospitals, they work alongside doctors, they, they must know something. Uh, maybe you can um, get into a little bit about the practical uh, impact of the Supreme Court decision and uh, how we should be, you know, thinking about um, private companies which and public companies which have the right to enforce uh, vaccination mandates and, again, what it means to be fully vaccinated, Bill. That will also be, I think, relevant here. But Fred, why don't start with you in terms yeah, of the decision. Yeah, um, uh, fortunately, our health system the university, at the University of Florida uh, did mandate the vaccine uh, fairly early on for everyone. And uh, although there was a little resistance, I think they've been relatively patient and uh, uh, steadily the, the vaccination rate has gone up. Now, they had to pause their mandate while the case was in court uh, but now that it's, uh, it's been found in favor of the health systems and in favor of controlling uh, the epidemic in, in the health centers, um, they will uh, continue. And I, I, don't, I do not perceive significant resistance. One of the problems we've seen with uh, the uh, most recent, with the Omicron, is because it's so highly infectious, a large number of healthcare providers have become infected somewhere around 20%. And uh, 
And if they had not been vaccinated, they would be out for much more prolonged periods um, and also would have to be under quarantine for more prolonged periods. And what we're rec the recommendations are now, if you are exposed um, and you're vaccinated, uh, and I think that's three vaccine, vaccine shots now, uh, then you, do, you can go back to work and you, as, long, as long as you stay symptomatic, you're fine. Uh, if you're not vaccinated, you can't you can't go to work and you need to quarantine. So this is really will make a big difference in the workforce. And so that health centers that have already vaccinated a high percentage of their uh, workers uh, will be able to withstand uh, this surge more readily because they are not going to lose as many workers. Uh, and that's one of the keys. And the other key, obviously, is we do not want to spread it to our patients. And I have to say that the Omicron is so infectious that we are seeing patients who come in without uh, COVID-19 actually contracting it in the hospital. Often it's been actually visitors, uh, family members who brought it in and gave it to their, their loved ones. So now, again, we're having to restrict visitors because of that issue. So um, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I've always been strongly in favor of of everyone getting vaccinated in the health system, and that is now uh, supported by law. You were asking about the, the practical impact. I don't know that it's going to have a huge practical impact because most hospitals and health systems have already been saying you have to get vaccinated. Um, yes, having the federal government gives them a little more ammunition. They can push it a little harder. They don't feel quite as bad about keeping people out if they're not vaccinated. But I, Fred, I, my impression has been that most hospitals are already doing this anyway. Um, yes, I agree. Yes. And so it hasn't, it hasn't been an impact. The problem is when they brought it up to the Supreme Court, then everybody had to back off temporarily. Well, it's also, so there look, was a little pause because yeah, of that. If I can, uh, a number of hospitals, Bill, faced legal challenges, uh, including um, from organized groups. And I will just tell you, I think this Saturday or uh, coming up, there's going to be supposedly, we'll see how big it is, a, but a, uh, a big rally against the vaccine mandates in Washington, D.C. Uh, at least Facebook is, is alive with uh, uh, attempting, you know, with people attempting to organize that. Uh, so, you know, just from in terms of litigation costs and hospitals having to respond to uh, the lawsuits, hopefully it will help to uh, focus on taking care of people. Part of the objective in managing this uh, pandemic has been to make sure that the hospitals are not overwhelmed and staff are not overwhelmed. And yet, um, maybe not everywhere in the country, uh, it appears that our hospital systems are really being stretched. I've, Followed reports in the Dakotas, um, in New Mexico, out west, um, and the statistics still seem to be saying, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the uh, it's the individuals who are unvaccinated who appear to be making up a large swath of that population. Is that an accurate conclusion? We're still fighting that front, Fred, Bill. Yes, there's actually some very good data that. Um, if you're an unvaccinated, that five times, you have five times the chance of being hospitalized of some versus somebody who is vaccinated. And that's, that may be an understatement, but it's at least five times. And the death rate, it's the number is into the teens. Yes, yeah, 70, 70, 80% of the admissions are in are unvaccinated, even with the Omicron. So um, the vaccination saves lives reduces hospitalizations. And I have to tell you, I've seen, I follow a number of healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, and others on Twitter who are all extremely upset that individuals still aren't being vaccinated. And what this means is they're taking beds from people that need care for other diseases and other ailments. Uh, and it's just, uh, the frustration is palpable among healthcare providers. And what they are all asking is, if you care at all about us, you will get vaccinated. If you care at all about other people who are sick for other reasons, you will get vaccinated to help them. 
Yeah, there, there's actually very good data from the um, British National Health Service that the the rate of adverse outcomes from other diseases, not COVID, from other diseases is way up because people aren't able to get the chronic diseases I'm talking about, because people aren't able to get the care that they need because the hospitals are and emergency rooms are filled with COVID patients that don't need that that shouldn't have had to be there in the first place. Yeah, and, and one of the other big problems uh, with uh, COVID-19 is that because the virus is so contagious, the percent of that needed to be vaccinated and immune is higher than for other infectious agents. Um, and it's going to need to be at 85%. Um, influenza, a 70 to 75% actually will almost achieve herd immunity because it's a less contagious uh, virus. So that makes it pressure is really on and if you're resistant, you have a bigger impact on others because we will not be able to achieve herd immunity because you don't want to get the vaccine. And there you could get 20% that were against the influenza vaccine, you could achieve herd immunity. Uh, but when it comes to COVID, it's got to be higher. And uh, there's just uh, a group of people that will not get vaccines. And that's really hurting us. And, and of course, we run into the problem ahead, that it was politicized from early on and politicized both directions. Right. Um, and once that happened, it just injected that that flavor into the whole thing. Okay. Closing uh, 60 seconds, uh, as we think about the week ahead, a lot of announcements about tests, uh, test kits on their way and uh, reimbursements from insurance companies. We'll, we'll discuss, you know, the practical uh, uh, implications of people testing next week. But what should we be looking for in the week ahead in terms of the data? I would look at the the state by state, city by city data for just focusing on the U.S. and see if we are seeing this primarily east to west um, turnover of these straight up curves that we've had to being on the downward slope. I think we're going to see that, but that's over the next week, we should we should have a really much better idea on that. Yeah, I agree. I, I think certainly the East Coast is going to start to come down uh, and it will move east to west uh, as far as the Omicron uh, surge goes. So let's hope um, it, the problem Delta takes longer to extinguish. And the problem in the Midwest is that Delta is still uh, a significant percentage of cases. So we may not see as much impact in the Midwest as we are going to see in the Northeast and the Southeast. Bill and Fred, as always, uh, thanks for your valuable time and the valuable insights. Stay safe and well, and look forward to the continued conversation next week. Thank you, Thank David. You, David. Dr. Bill Lang is an expert in public health responses to biological incidents, including pandemics. Dr. Fred Southwick is an infectious disease specialist at the University of Florida College of Medicine. Both doctors are part of the RAIN Expert Network. Individuals and organizations turn to RAIN for risk intelligence that cuts through the hype to focus on what they need to know, what to expect, and what to do. Sign up for our coronavirus solution. Visit us at rainnetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E network.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening.